All right, so I, I, I set out with the goal of writing a shorter sermon this week because I know I preached for a long time last week. Thank you so much for hanging in there for all of those of you who didn't fall asleep on me. I really appreciate it. Um, but there was just a lot to cover last week. There just really was. And I hope that uh, the word from last week really changed, brought change into your life. So this week I set out to write a shorter sermon and yet I have the same amount of, I have the same word count as I did last week. So we'll see what it ends up uh, being. But let's open our Bibles to James 1, 22 through 25. James 1, 22 through 25. Now here we really get into sort of the meat and potatoes, so to speak, of what James is all about. And that is the outward action, the outward response of, do I have something on me? Joel's going like this. I have a piece of drumstick on me. <laughs> Thanks, Joel. We really get into the meat and potatoes of the, of the book of James. And really the book of James, as we talked about many times, it's about putting outward action to this inward faith, this changing faith uh, of, uh, of Christianity, where Christ renews us, restores us, and creates a new creation in us. James is all about how that life looks. Right? We know from Ephesians, Ephesians tells us to live a life worthy of a manner in which we've been called. Well, James is really the blueprint for that in a lot of ways. It's not the blueprint, but it is a blueprint. It has a lot of things that we'll be discussing over the next few weeks. But in James 1, 22 through 25, James kind of puts uh, kind of uh, uh, the context to what he's going to write over the next several chapters. And it's this, starting in verse 22. But prove yourselves doers of the word, and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. Can you imagine? But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. And that is an important word there, in what he does. I just want to make this distinction now. It's not because of what he does. And we're going to get to that in a little bit. Uh, in a little bit. But remember, this man is blessed in what he does. So like I said, we're in the meat and potato, uh, so, to, so to speak, of this, of this epistle. James will pretty much spend the rest of the, 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 the chapters of this book as he's inspired by the Holy Spirit to write on how to effectually be a doer of the word. And so think of this as a, spring, a springboard, a platform as we leap off into those daily instructions of how to live a life that is worthy of the calling in which we've been called. You see, when a man or woman is regenerated into life through the power of the Holy Spirit, there is always, and I'm going to say this, always an undeniable change in that person's life. When a person is regenerated to life through the Spirit, I'll say it again, there is always noticeable, even uh, earth-shattering change. Many of you who, who, who grew up uh, not in a Christian home and yet were called to faith through the power of the Spirit, you can look back on your life and see, whoa, there was a massive change in my life. It was like flipping a switch. That is the power of the Spirit. That is the power of someone who is a doer of the Word versus simply a hearer of the Word. And I'll explain that quite a bit more as we go. But you see, there's a problem. There's a problem in the professing church today. That problem is, in many people who profess Christ, there is no change. They look exactly like the world, think exactly like the world, act exactly like the world. Even many church services are designed to, to impress the world. Not to impress God, but they're designed to impress the world. And so James here begins bridging the gap, brothers and sisters, and this is important, from an intellectual version of Christianity, which is a false and fruitless religion. An intellectual Christianity, we need to understand, is just as false as Islam, is just as false as Roman Catholicism, is just as false as a Jehovah's Witness. Intellectual Christianity is what James is trying to differentiate between that and a saving faith in Jesus Christ, which always produces good outward fruit. Remember what Jesus says in Matthew seven nineteen. He says, 
whichever tree does not produce good fruit will be cut down and where will it be thrown? Into the fire. So church, we need to understand first of all that James is not saying we are saved by our good works. That is why he says we'll be blessed in what we do, not blessed because of what we do. What he says is, if you are truly saved, if God has truly come in through the power of the Holy Spirit, regenerated you to life in him, you will produce good fruit. It will be inevitable. Now, as we read in our main text this morning, one question that always comes to mind is, if James says we must be a doer of the word, what in particular is James referring to? Or is he just referring to a doer in general? We must look at the Word of God and just do all the things the Word of God tells us. And that's an interesting question, and one that's been debated uh, throughout the centuries. However, I'll save you uh, some suspense and some study, and I'll just tell you I believe James is referring to a very specific act when he says you must be a doer of the word. And I didn't come here uh, alone. Actually, the vast majority of biblical scholars land on the same point. And as we examine the word of God further, I'll make that much more clear. But James is actually talking about very specifically what we must be a doer of. What we must be a doer of. And so when we come to the word of God, we must come to the word of God with a proper understanding of the context. Otherwise, we, don't, we won't get what St. James is saying here and we won't get what he's getting at down the road. And when it comes to a true saving faith, one that produces an outward change, one that transforms a hearer into a doer, we must always start with the gospel. And that is really what James is pointing to here. Now, there are several reasons why we know James is pointing to that effectual calling of the gospel, that, that changing of the gospel. There are several points that help us point, point, uh, point us to that. And we'll get into that in a moment. But it is the gospel, church, first and foremost, that changes a man from a state of death, from a state of simply hearing to a state of understanding and doing. The gospel is the only message on earth that has the power to do that. The only message on earth that has the power to do that. And the word of God plays a vital role, church, in the gospel, right? We wouldn't know the gospel unless it were here. So the word of God plays a vital role. If we look back, and if you have your Bibles open, you can do that. Look back to verse 21. What's the last half a sentence that James writes before he writes verse 22? Amen. He says, we, the last half of that, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. So there's no, there, there, no, there's no mistake that James is pointing to the gospel here. The word implanted that is able to save our souls is what? The gospel. It's the only thing that can be implanted in the heart of a man that can save us. There is no other word, there is no other men, message given to men that they must obey to be saved. And so immediately following this statement from verse 21, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. Then he declares that after hearing this word that is able to save your souls, we must prove to be a doer of that word that has been implanted, the gospel. And so with this in mind, let's clarify this message together and this meaning together, starting in verse 22. It says this, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Really, what James is doing here is he's just echoing the teachings of Jesus. That's all he's doing. No amount of hearing, church, no amount of knowledge, no amount of intellectual prowess can save a man. What does Jesus say to the Pharisees all the time? An example out of Mark, Mark uh, 4.12. This won't be on the screen, but you know, many of you may know this. Jesus talking to the Pharisees, he tells them, while seeing, they may not see and not perceive, while hearing they, they may hear and not understand. Otherwise, they might return and be forgiven. So Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. He said even though they hear, even though they see, they don't understand and they don't truly perceive. And that's a direct quote from Isaiah 6, 9. Mark 4.12 is a direct quote by Jesus from Isaiah 6.9. Or what about when Jesus pronounces the seven woes to the Pharisees? Remember I preached a whole, I don't know, several weeks on the seven woes, probably at least seven weeks, that's my guess. What does Jesus say to them? Does he say to the Pharisees, you, aren't, you, 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 you don't have the knowledge, you don't have the intellectual understanding of the word of God? No, he doesn't tell them that. 
He tells them that they don't do the things the word of God tells them to. And because of that, Jesus calls them what? Blind guides and hypocrites. You see, the Pharisees' problem wasn't that they didn't know what the Bible said. The Pharisees' problem was that they were not doers of what the word of God said. And that is the catch this morning that we'll discuss. They did not practice what they claimed to know. They did not practice what they had knowledge of. What would you think if I told you that I was hit by a semi-truck on the way to church this morning? I was walking down the highway and a semi just came and whacked me at 75 miles an hour. That's why I was a little late. What would you think of me? You'd think I was a liar, right? Because if I was hit by a semi-truck on the highway this morning, I would be changed, wouldn't I? I would be quite literally changed in an instant, unrecognizably changed in an instant. But there are literally countless multitudes of professing Christians throughout this country, maybe in this body, that claim they've met with the God of the universe and yet they look exactly like they did before they met him. They act like, they think like, they do the things they did before that meeting and yet they claim to know Christ. Brothers and sisters, truly meeting the God of the universe through the gospel of Jesus Christ will change you far more unrecognizably than getting hit by a semi-truck if you truly met your Savior. Your life, your actions, your deeds will look completely and totally opposite to anyone who knew you before the change of the gospel that was brought into your life. But brothers and sister, sisters, this version of religion, this pharisaical version of religion, is not limited to, to those in Jesus' time. It is alive and well, unfortunately, among us today. I would venture to say that this version of false religion, this version that just professes Christ on a Sunday morning, and yet their lives look exactly like the world's life throughout the week, is the most practiced religion in this country. The vast majority of people sitting in pews in this country this morning and perhaps around the world, I'm not sure, claim to have the knowledge of the gospel and yet their life has no effectual change. It looks no different. They will not do what the word commands. And the mere fact that they went to church and listened to the word of God will pacify them for another week. And they will leave the presence of God unchanged and really, as James puts it, in a state of delusion. Delusional. Far too many professing Christians will, will be like the Matthew 7 man who cries out, Lord, Lord, on the day of judgment. And what does God say to them? Depart from me, you who work iniquity. Because the gospel has not changed them. They have been ever hearing and never perceiving ever seeing, but never understanding, as Jesus prophesied. Have you ever thought about this before? And perhaps you have. Even the most frequent and, uh, and attentive hearing of God's word cannot save your soul. It does not benefit you unless you actually do what it says. The gospel will have no effect in your life until you actually respond to the gospel's call. And many of us who have been witnessing on the street many times, I've witnessed one-on-one -on -one to several thousand people over the past 10 years. And I understand it's God's, it's God's uh, power that saves, not my own. But I have shared the gospel many times with people and they've just shook my hand and said thank you and walked away. And I don't know if God has brought an effectual change in their life yet or not. But many times they hear the word of truth and yet it, 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 is no, it, it uh, accomplishes, rather, no change in their life. So let's look at verse 23 together. How, did, how do we know that James is specifically talking about the gospel, this effectual doing of the word? Well, let's begin to examine that for a little bit. 
Verse 23 says this, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he is. And this is where James begins to put his clear meaning into focus for us. When you look in the mirror, what does the mirror show you? Your true self, doesn't it? You can't hide from the mirror. Sure, you can get a trick mirror, but I'm not talking about that. If you look into a clear mirror, what does it show you? It shows you your true self. It shows you exactly what you look like, right? Every scar, every blemish, every deformed, crooked nose, every fill in the blank of all the things, all the imperfections of our body and of our face are clear in that mirror. It exposes, church. That's what a mirror does. It exposes and that is James' meaning here. When you look in a mirror, it exposes who you really are. And yet a fool will walk away and forget who he really is. The old saying goes like this. The mirror will show you what you look like as plain as the nose on your face, right? You can't get away from it. The mirror will show you. A mirror will even show you the things you try to cover up with makeup, perhaps, and whether you like it or not, the mirror doesn't lie. It always shows us our true self. In church, the word of God does the same. And that is James's meaning here. The word of God does the same. It exposes us, church. It is like a mirror unto our souls. It shows us our true self. James is telling, is telling us that the word of truth is able to save our souls. In verse 21, and then verse 22, he says the word of truth is like a mirror to our souls. And the true reflection of our soul, brothers and sisters, is not pretty, is it? The true reflection of who we truly are, apart from Christ, is not a pretty thing. It's not a pretty thing at all. The word of God is a lamp that illuminates the darkness of your soul, illuminates the darkness of your human sin. It is a spotlight onto, into the true state of your spiritual condition. Just as a mirror is a spotlight, so to speak, into the true state of our physical appearance. The word of God, brothers and sisters, was not given to us to flatter you or to flatter me. It was given to us to expose us, to expose our sin. Specifically, James is talking about how the law of God exposes the sin of man. The whole world is guilty before God and the Ten Commandments show us just how guilty we are. The Mosaic Law. And that's what James is referring to here, to being a doer of the word. What is the mirror that shows us our true self? Well, it's the law. How do we know James is talking about the Old Testament law? Because in the very next verse we'll get to in a minute, he talks about the law of liberty, which stands opposed to the law of death, as, as Paul calls the Old Testament law. And we'll get to that in a moment. Have you ever thought about why society hates the word of God so much, church? Why does society hate the word of God? Think about why every organization, secular organization you can think of, wants the Ten Commandments removed from schools, removed from courthouses, removed from government buildings. Why do they not want to look upon the Ten Commandments, church? Because it's a mirror that shows them and exposes their sin. That's why the world hates the word of truth. That is why the world hates to look upon and gaze upon the mirror of God's word, which is the law. It's because the word of God and the law exposes just how horribly ugly and sinful man is. Just how filthy every man is before a holy God. And there are two reasons, like I said, we know that James is, is referring to this, this law as being the mirror here. The first is, in the next verse, which, which I, already, I already mentioned, he, he, he refers to the law of liberty. So there's a contrast here. He says the law, uh, he says the word of truth is like a mirror, shows a man his true self, and then he talks about the law of liberty in the next verse. But also... Uh, which, which is what uh, Paul calls uh, the law of death in Romans 8, chap or chapter 8, verse 2. The law of liberty or liberation is the gospel, which, which uh, James gets to in the next verse, which saves us from the penalty of breaking the Old Testament law, which is the mirror. The second way we know this is because whenever the Old Testament law is spoken of in the New Testament, it's always one way or another equated with something that helps us see ourselves in a true light. And I'm going to give us a few examples of that from Romans here in a moment. 
moment. Uh, it doesn't exactly say mirror, but James puts that context to it. But whenever the Old Testament law is spoken of, it always is spoken of as, in a way that shows us our true self as a mirror would. Let's look at Romans 7, 7 through 10 here real quick together. It'll be up on the screen as well if you don't want to flip to it. But let's see what Paul says about the Old Testament law in Romans 7, 7 through 10. He says this, what shall we say then? Is the law sin, the Old Testament law sin? Should be capital L in your Bible. May it never be. On the contrary, I would have not, I would have, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. A mirror. I wouldn't have come to even know what sin was until I gazed upon the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. But when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. For sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. Let's look at Romans 3, 19 through 20. Verse 19 says this. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, which by the way is the whole world is under the law, uh, the, the whole world that's apart from Christ anyways, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may, may become accountable to God. The law is a mirror, church. The Ten Commandments is a mirror so that the world can see that they are accountable to God, that they have broken every one of his commands and now they will stand they will stand before God and be judged without Christ upon that law. Going on, verse 20, because the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sights. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Again, a mirror. Through the mirror comes the knowledge of what you look like. Through the mirror of God's law comes the knowledge of sin. Let's look for a moment at the Ten Commandments, just very quickly. I know we've done this exercise for those of you who've been to this church many times before, but let's look at the mirror of God's law for a moment, and let's see how many of these we pass, right? They'll be up on the screen. First commandment is this, you shall have no other gods before me, right? How many of us have served God and God only our whole life all the time? Not one of us. And if you say you have, then you're calling Jesus a liar because he, because he says nobody loves God all the time. He says nobody can love God that good. Number two, you shall not fashion an idol. Now, an idol can be something you actually make, like a graven image with your hand, or it can be something that you serve above God, like money or fill in the blank with several things. How many, have, how many of you have ever created an idol that has become more important in your life than God? Probably every one of us, right? So when you look in this mirror of God's law, we don't like what we see. We don't like what we see. Verse, I mean, uh, the third one, you shall not take the, word, the name of the Lord your God in vain. How many of you ever used God's name as a cuss word before? Or just flippantly said OMG without truly giving praise to God or calling upon God? Let's look at number four. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. How many of us always set aside one day in seven every week, devoted and dedicated unto the Lord? Number five, honor your father and mother. Anyone who has always honored their father and mother here this morning? No. You shall not murder. You might think you're off the hook with this one, but Jesus says, he who hates his brother is a murderer. So if you've ever hated anyone, you're a murderer in God's eyes. That's God's standard. It's an impossible standard. And if you want to talk about how impossible, you want to learn about how impossible it is, just read the Sermon on the Mount later today, Matthew 5 through 7. Go back and read the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus will show you just how impossible it is to fulfill the law. You see, the law was not given to save men, but to expose men. Jesus Christ was given to save men. You shall not commit adultery. Ooh, how many of us have ever lusted, even in our mind? That's what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6. He says, if you've even lusted after a woman, you've committed adultery already within your heart. That's God's standard. You shall not steal. You shall not bear a false witness against your neighbor. You shall not lie. You shall not covet. You see, the world hates this mirror, church. They hate it because it exposes who they are. It exposes their sin and shows them just how much trouble they will be in before a holy God on judgment day. But hallelujah, for those who've been saved, this same mirror, the same mirror, 
calls those who have been saved to be effectual doers in response to the gospel. You see, it is the word of the Old Testament law that has the job of leading us to Christ. Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 says that. Actually, depending on the, the, um, uh, the uh, translation you have of the Bible, many translations say the law, the Old Testament law, is a schoolmaster that leads us to Christ. So the law serves an, incredibly, um, uh, an incredible purpose in the gospel church. The law exposes us, shows us how helpless we are without a Savior, and then leads us to the Savior. The law is very important in bringing about the knowledge of sin as a mirror brings about the knowledge of one, what one looks like. And what James is warning us against is this. The fool looks intently upon the mirror of God's law. They see that they are wicked. They see that they have fallen short of God's command and then they walk away and they forget who they really are. That's what James is pointing out. A fool Someone who only hears, sees who they truly are before God by gazing upon the law. And then as soon as they walk away, they try to convince themselves that they're actually good people. That when, when, when they die, they'll just reason with God. And God, it'll all work out. It'll all work out. God, God will just, he'll just let me go. I really haven't done anything that bad. That's what James is talking about here. The fool looks intently upon the mirror of God's word, sees how filthy wicked he is, and then walks away and forgets. Tries to convince himself he is good. Tries to convince himself the things he is doing is good. Think about abortion right now, church. Think about it. The, the, the pro-abortion, uh, those who, who subscribe to pro-abortion, they try to convince themselves they are doing good, don't they? They take something as wicked as abortion and try to make it good. They walk away from the mirror and forget what they look like. They forget who they truly are. Now that is just one thing. It, it, you could fill in the blank with many things. Uh, homosexual lifestyle and this whole uh, just absolute mind-melting ridiculousness of this transgenderism, like that's even a thing. The world tries to convince itself that these things are good. They walk away from the mirror and they forget who they truly are try to convince themselves that when they meet God on Judgment Day, they'll be A-OK. -okay. And that is what James is warning about. Don't be someone who is delusional. James actually calls a person who looks intently upon the Word of God, the law of God, sees how wicked they are, walks away, and then tries to convince themselves that what they are doing as good, James calls them delusional absolutely lost their minds. Look up the, de I didn't put it up here because I wanted to save time. Look up the definition of delusional this morning. You've lost your marbles, is what James is saying. You have absolutely lost your mind if you look at the word of God. See how sinful you are. Don't respond to the gospel call. Walk away and try to convince yourself that you are good. Proverbs 21.2 says this, and this is really, again, remember there's a lot of parallels in Proverbs and James. This is one. Every man's way is right in his own eyes. And how true is that, church? How true is that? Every man's way is right in his own eyes. But that doesn't matter because the Lord weighs the heart. Right? You can think you're right all you want. <coughs> But it is the Lord, and the Lord alone, who has set the standard, church. Remember, the word of truth implanted in the heart of a true hearer will save his soul. But the word of, but the word of truth, when it is not implanted in the heart, it is just an intellectual understanding, it will have no such effect. It'll be like throwing stones at a great brick wall. And church, I believe the vast majority of the professing church professing Christians are no better off than the most openly wicked God-haters among us. Actually, I, I believe Hebrews chapter 6, if you want to read that later today, I believe Hebrews chapter 6 says those who have tasted some of the good things of God and yet have rejected it are worse off, yeah. worse off than those who are just simply God-haters and have never, uh, have never uh, acknowledged God in any way, shape, or form. You can read Hebrews 6 later, but I believe they are actually worse off. They hear the word of God every Sunday. They sit there in the pew, and yet there is no change in their lives because they are ever hearing and never perceiving. 
They have never understood that apart from a true saving knowledge, gospel knowledge of Jesus Christ, that they are doomed. They are hearers only, trusting a false gospel to save them. One that puts an emphasis on happiness and not righteousness. What does Jesus say? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for being happy in this life? No, he doesn't say that. He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, which means a right standing with God. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for a right standing with God. Those are the ones who become effectual doers through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just sitting in a pew, listening to the word of God preached, hoping to hear some message to give you a little bit of hope to get through your life struggle, that is not the gospel. And that is what many people do on Sunday mornings. Look at Joel Olstein's church or any of those types of churches. It's all about feeling happy. Brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter how happy you are or aren't in this life. What matters is how, if you are righteous in a right standing before God, that's what matters. I mean, I, I, I don't, don't want to go into all this, but how many, how many Christians have suffered under torment, torture, pain, and death for the gospel. If, 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 this, if this life is all about how happy you are, then why did God forsake those people? He didn't. Because it's not about how happy you are. It's about how righteous you are before God through the blood of Jesus Christ. And the word of truth will expose your true self. And he who looks upon that word of truth and responds to it, becomes a doer of the word, becomes saved. And that is what James is pointing us to this morning. We do not want to be hearers only, church. I do not want any of you, I do not want myself to be a hearer only of the word of God. I could be the most eloquent preacher, the best preacher on the planet, which I'm not, but if I was, it would do you no good. It would do you no good if your heart was resistant because of your deluded mind, of who you truly were. And this is the reason the American church today looks so much like the world, right? Because it is the world in many cases. And I'm not saying all churches. There are great churches out there with a lot of God-fearing people. I'm not saying all. But in the, in, I would say uh, the vast majority, almost 90% of this country calls, them, calls themselves Christian church. And yet less than 18%, it's like 17.6% or something like that, actually believe the Bible is true word from word beginning to end. Yet 90% of the people claim they're Christian, but only less than 20% of them believe that this book is even true. I mean, we could go on and on with the statistics, church. About only 45% of the professing church believe that homosexuality is a sin. The other 55% believe it's just A-OK. -okay. There's a problem. Professing Christ, professing and just saying I'm a Christian, does not mean that you are. The world is delusional church, even many professing Christians are delusional. They forget who they truly are. They think they are saved when they are not, and the proof is where? According to James, it's in their lifestyle. It's in the things they think, how they act, what they do. There's the proof. The proof is in the pudding. Many of us know that old saying. The Bible is, this, is very clear. The proof is in the pudding. Your life will be different. You cannot meet the creator of the universe in true gospel-saving fashion and remain the same. It's impossible. Now, don't become confused like Martin Luther did. Martin Luther came, became a little confused about the book of James. He called it the epistle of straw. He didn't like this book because he thought it taught... Uh, he thought it taught good deeds will save you. That's not what James is saying. Absolutely not. Your lifestyle, your good deeds can never save you. And James doesn't teach that either. He is teaching us that whoever is a truly a doer of the word, whoever who has truly responded to the gospel, it is an inevitable outcome that their life will look different. That's all he's saying. And then he's saying how it will look different and giving us instruction on how to live that way. Right? It's, a, it's, it's by default. The Christian, the true gospel saving grace of God to Jesus Christ, the true Christian, by default, they will look different. 
And if you are not changed this morning, if your life looks more like the world than it looks like what the Bible teaches us a Christian ought to look like. Remember, Christian just means Christ-like. We're to be more and more Christ-like. Now, obviously, we're never going to attain that because, because Jesus Christ was perfect. But are we working towards that? When you look back 10 years ago, are you a different person now than you were 10 years ago? Has God done effectual change in your life that now you are an effectual doer of more and more things of God's word? It's called sanctification. Are you more sanctified now than you were 10 years ago? Too often the church today is far more concerned with entertainment than righteousness. Entertaining the masses. And what I believe the version of Christianity that many people pro profess in this culture today are simply emotional hearers of the Word of God. They hear the Word of God, they get all emotional about it, they say, yeah, I'm going to do that, and then they leave, and then Monday they're doing the same things they were on Saturday before they went to church. Why? Because it's impossible for a man to change himself. That's why. So you see, when the power of the Holy Spirit hasn't changed us and quickened us to life, you can try and try and try and try and try and try and you will fail and fail and fail and fail and fail and fail. Because what is impossible for man is only made possible with God himself. Only made possible with God himself. If you this morning are a hearer of the word and are not changed by the power of the gospel, you could even try to do every single thing that James tells you to do after this. Because James will get into moral living. And all it will accomplish in your life is maybe some form of morality. Not a saving faith. That's why we must start here, and that's why James starts here with the gospel. An effectual doer is one who has been transformed by the power of the gospel. And being transformed by the power of the gospel makes everything else he's going to say actually accomplishable. Because we're not doing it under our own power. We're doing it under the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the entire point of the book of James. James. An effectual doer, one who is saved by the grace of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ, will then be able to have the ability to be sanctified. And only then. I, I, this is a while back in my, uh, my life, but I, I knew a person who was trying to disciple an unsaved person. Impossible, right? Impossible. Now, I'm not saying that we can't go to that person and share the gospel with them and talk to them about the saving grace of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. But if you are trying to disciple an unbeliever, unbeliever, unbeliever you will become frustrated because it is impossible, impossible for that person to be sanctified until they have surrendered themselves humbly before the Lord. We're going to get into this in greater detail of the effectual doing beyond the gospel, the effectual doing of the call of the Christian, the God-honoring lifestyle. But church, it all starts here with the gospel. It all starts here. It always does. It starts with the gospel. What does Jesus say in the Beatitudes? He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Spiritual poverty is a lost art in today's culture, church. I would say just in today's culture in general, but, but especially in the Christian church as well. We are called to spiritual poverty. And I preached a whole message on this uh, a couple years ago. You can find it in our archives if you would like to uh, listen to that later. Church, we have been force-fed that we are somebody, that we have rights, that we are important, that we ought to have very high self-esteem of ourselves. That is what the culture teaches us, church. I was in school, in, in, in uh, public school, and I was taught that from when I was a little kid all the way through. A high self-esteem is very important. No. A low position, understanding your low position and who you truly are is what's important. Now, I'm not saying we walk around with like eating worms, woe is me. What I'm saying is understanding who we truly, truly are is the only thing. That's a humility, the only thing that will bring us to a saving knowledge of Christ. If I walk around thinking I'm somebody, that I have high self-esteem, that I'm this great person, I'm never going to turn to the Savior, ever, because I, I won't have a need. And so, as a culture, we think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. Far too often. We think we are the cat's meow. 
we even think we are good when Jesus says you are actually evil, right? What is, uh, what, what, what is, how does Jesus answer when he's asked about, uh, uh, when, when he, when, I can't remember the question off the top of my head that's, that he's asked, but he says, which of you, even though you are evil, would give a bad thing to their, to their son when, they're, when they ask, right? Jesus calls us evil. Even, even you who are evil, you would give good things to your son. How much better things will God give you? And of course, Jesus was referring to himself in the gospel. How much better of a thing will God give to you? Even you who are evil. But church, we don't do that. We've been conditioned to think we are good. But what does Jesus say? No man is good but God alone. And so many in the church have never truly confessed their sins, humbled themselves before Christ because they have been told they're good without him. And I say this, and so does the Bible. No, you are not good. And no, I am not good. I am a wicked man saved only by the grace of God. Hallelujah. And only when I humble myself after hearing the gospel, repent, and become an effectual doer of the word of truth. What James says over the next few chapters is moot. Like I said before, if you are living this morning in a life of delusion, if you have not surrendered in humility to the gospel of Jesus Christ, you, you have no point in listening to what James says next because it will be like this. It'll go right over your head. If you are not truly saved, if you are not a doer of the gospel, the doer of what the gospel calls you to, which is, like I said, confession and repentance, then ultimately you, you will perish on the last day, regardless of if you read the rest of this book or not. And so, brothers and sisters, the mirror of God's word mortally wounds our souls, and it ought to, and it should. When you read the Ten Commandments, you should, oh, it should be like, oh, I've, uh, yes, I've done that. I've fallen short there. Oh, Lord, I have, I have committed that sin more times than I care to admit. The Old Testament law wounds our souls. But hallelujah, the law of liberty heals our souls. And that's what James gets into next in verse 25. He says this, but one who looks intently at the perfect law, the old law wasn't perfect. James is making that case. Paul makes that case throughout Romans. The old law wasn't perfect. The old law was a law unto death, as Paul says. It only produced death. It is impossible for you to keep the whole law. James will go on to say in, later on in, in, in this book, I think it's chapter four, that he who breaks, who keeps, the, no, chapter two, he who keeps the whole law and yet breaks it at one point is what? Guilty. That's what James says. Guilty. You could keep the whole law and yet break it at one point. You're guilty. You're toast. You're done. You are condemned before a holy God. You see, the New Testament, rightfully so, goes out of its way to make sure we know that the whole world is under the Old Testament law. I, I've heard Christians say the Old Testament law doesn't really matter anymore. Oh, my, well, I just knocked my thing off. How foolish of a statement. The Old Testament law is binding to every single person who is not in Christ. They will be judged based upon that law on Judgment Day. And that's why James says this, but he who looks intently upon the perfect law, the law of liberty, which is the gospel, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. Don't you just love that three-letter word that James starts verse 25 out with? I love that word. The word is but. Praise God there is always another promise. Right? The promise for those who, who, who are never effectual doers that forget who they are when they look upon the, the, the law and, and try to convince themselves they're good, they're, they're condemned. But praise God, there's a but here. But he who abides by the perfect law, the law of liberty, he will find life. <clears throat> After looking upon the law of death, the Ten Commandments, and becoming convinced that we are, as Paul says, those who have transgressed the law, the one who looks intently upon the law of liberty, the gospel, and abides by it, he will find God's eternal blessing. Praise God this morning, church. Because if the story ended with the law of God, if God just simply gave the law to Israel and never gave anything else, we would all be condemned to hell with no way out. But he didn't. 
because he gave us the gospel, the law of liberty. Now we must understand that James is not saying that the gospel frees us to practice sin. That's not what the law of liberty is. Paul even says, may it never be so, right? May it never be so that I can just continue on sinning, right? We need to think of the law of liberty as James has described it as the law of liberation. It liberates us from death. It doesn't liberate us to sin. It liberates us from the penalty of sin. It's the law of liberation, the law that sets us free. The law of liberty, then, is the gospel promise, church. Humble yourselves. Confess your sins before God. Follow him. Um, uh, confess your sins before God. Look up, uh, upon Jesus Christ and his blood as your only way to righteousness with the Father and follow him. You see, the gospel is the biggest solution to the world's biggest problem. When you turn on the news, it's so disheartening. All the stuff the world is concerned about. I'm not saying some of those things aren't important, church, but the most important thing never gets talked about on the news. The biggest problem in the world is sin. The biggest solution to that problem is the gospel. But I'm going to take this one step further, even in our own Christian lives. How many times do you talk and talk and talk about things with people who are clearly not saved and fail to share the gospel with them? The only thing that truly matters. The only thing that truly matters. Man was dead in his sin, hopeless under the bondage of the law, and yet Jesus Christ took yours and my punishment upon himself. He died in our place, a substitutionary death. He paid for your sin and for my sin. And the price of that sin was death. Right? For the wages of sin is death. So that all that repent and follow him might be saved, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, that is the law of liberation that, G that James is talking about. The law of death. The law that we look into as a mirror cannot save us. Only the law of liberation can, the gospel. Those who were once slaves to sin and slaves to the penalty of sin have been set free, not to sin more, but to be rescued. But there's always a qualifier with the word of God, isn't there, right? If you uh, read, read Deuteronomy, uh, I just got done reading it. When, it's been a couple months now, but I just got done reading Deuteronomy. When God gives his promises, it's always if, right? Always, every single time. I will do X, Y, and Z if you do X, Y, and Z, right? So what is our only qualifier then for the gospel? What is our only qualifier? He who not only looks intently into the law of liberty, James says, but he who abides by it, right? Abiding by it means living by it, staking your whole entire life upon it. That's what James is saying. Abiding mean, is, is a word that is used to deeply and, and uh, uh, with full understanding live by a certain uh, set of principles, a set of rules, right? He who looks intently and abides by the, 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 the truth, the declaration of the gospel. He is the one. So just knowing, again, James is trying to make the point, just knowing about the gospel isn't what saves us. It is those who respond to the gospel's call. Repentance, confession, faith in Jesus Christ. And then surrender your whole life. And that's what James is saying. He who abides in the gospel is somebody who stakes their whole entire life upon it. In John chapter 15, Jesus pleads with his disciples to do the same thing. Remember John chapter 15? It's the, it's the chapter where Jesus spends most of the entire chapter saying, abide in me, continue in me. I'm going. I'm, I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to die. But you must continue on in me. You must abide in me. You must stake your life upon the gospel, the things that I am teaching you. You must... Remain firmly planted, grafted into the vine. That's what Jesus says in Matthew 15. We must walk with him and follow him, church. We must obey him. And that is James' final point, because that is the way to blessings, church. That is the way to blessings. And unfortunately, there are all sorts of bad teachings out there of how to find and receive God's blessings and rewards. There's a, there's a lot of bad teaching out there. Oh, it's, it's hard to... It's so sad. It's so sad. I don't even have time really to get started on how much bad teaching there are to how to find blessing and rewards. 
in, in, God's, uh, in God's kingdom. James tells us right here, he who abides in the gospel will be blessed in what? Just once, once in a while? No, he'll be blessed in all that he does. He who abides in the gospel. That's how we come to the, God's blessings in this life and the next, church. Let's read the end of verse, of, of, of verse 25 again. I think I have it right back here. He says this. Well, let's read the whole thing. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, so one that lives and stakes his life upon the gospel, this man will be blessed in what he does. There's no other qualifier there, church. Walking in the, 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 the gospel and living a life uh, directed by the gospel is how we find God's blessing. There's no special prayer to pray. There's a book, many of you have probably read it, it's garbage, don't read it anymore, called The Prayer of, prayer of Jabez. It's ridiculous. I'm not saying Jabez's prayer was ridiculous. I'm saying the interpretation of this man who wrote the book is ridiculous. Church, there's no special mantra you can play, pray to find God's blessings in your life. James tells us what it is. Abide in the gospel. And, and everything you do will be blessed by God. There's your format, church. There it is. Now, I'm not saying we don't pray, Lord, bless this thing that I'm about to do for your purpose and your will. But the problem is in this culture, especially in the name it and claim it culture, the, the prosperity gospel culture, is that blessings are equated with money and riches and new cars and homes and vacation properties and baloney. That is not what the promise of the gospel is. That is not the promise. That's not even the promise of these blessings. It just means that everything that we do that is governed by a life lived in the gospel will be blessed of God in one way or another. Doesn't mean money. In this prosperity culture, we've turned it into that. There's no magic mantra you can pray, church. We must live a life governed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. We must commit our lives to Christ, to walk in the gospel, to abide in the gospel truth, and to allow the word of God to govern our every action. That is how we will be, we'll be blessed in what we do. It's that simple. It's hard to do. It's hard to do, but the explanation is that simple. Basically, the faithful children of God who abide in him receive the blessing of God. All of them do. Every one of God's children who abide and walk in the gospel receive God's blessing, period. You don't get more because you said a prayer that I didn't say. All of them will be blessed in what he does. Not only those, like I said, who have read a certain book or said a certain prayer will be blessed in what he does. All of them will. But the qualifier is he must abide in the gospel truth. We must notice something of vital importance here. And I said this at the very beginning of the sermon. We'll end with this understanding. James says this man will be blessed in what he does, not because of what he does. Now that is massively important, church. We cannot understate how important it is to understand what James is saying. He will be blessed in the things that he does not because of the things that he does. Every single false religion on the planet teaches you that you will be blessed because of what you do. Roman Catholicism, Satan's master religion, you will be blessed because of what you do. Islam, you will be blessed because you pray X amount of times a day facing Mecca. Jehovah's Witness, you will be blessed because you have put in your time going door to door. Mormons, same thing, you will be blessed because of what you do. Every false religion, Buddhism, same thing. You can go on down the list. Why? Because Satan is the ultimate uh, creator of false religions and he is going to do everything opposite of what God tells him to do. That's why every false religion tells you you'll be blessed by what you do. Your deeds will acquire you uh, favor with God. The gospel stands apart, church. The only religion on earth that says you can do nothing to earn God's favor. Nothing. You are hopeless. You are helpless without a Savior. Jesus Christ, the world's only true hero, brothers and sisters, only true hero that has come in and has saved us from the bondage and the slavery to sin. That's it. You will be blessed if you abide in the gospel. You will be blessed in the things you do, not because you have done them. Anyone who teaches you that you will be blessed because you say a prayer, because you have read a certain book that some other Christian didn't, that is heresy. That is not the teaching of God's word. 
The man or woman who abides in the law of liberty, the gospel, rests and remains dependent upon the gospel's promise. He will be blessed in, their, in his work. Everything we touch will be blessed. Now, that does not mean money all the time. We've got to just pound that out of our heads in this country. Money and possessions. Actually, I'd say God probably, if he was really treating us fairly, many of us, he would withhold money and possessions from because we'd blow it. That money would become our God. When you are obedient to God's will and the work he's given you in your life and you are abiding in the gospel church, what God is saying is he will accomplish his purpose in you always. You will be blessed in all that you do. When you go to work, maybe a job you don't even like on Monday, and yet you do that abiding in the gospel's power, abiding in who you are in Christ and doing whatever God sets before you the way he's called you to, God promises a blessing in that. He'll bless that situation, that scenario, that workplace in some way because, because you are abiding in Christ. And again, the blessing church isn't found in simply hearing and knowing about God's word, but doing God's will, which is what? God commands all men to repent and be saved, right? That's God's will for man. Those of us who have repented and are saved and are abiding in Christ, you are doing God's will just in that step. And of course, there's much more to do. James gets into that later, but it starts here. And I hope you understand the importance of what James is saying here. Anything else he says next doesn't mean a thing if you are apart from Christ. You are a delusional person living in delusion land. <laughs> and I don't want anyone to be that. And neither does God. We can't simply be a hearer of God's word. John 13, 17, Jesus says this, and this is so important for us this morning. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Amen. Amen. It is not the talking, excuse me, but the walking that will, we, that will prove whether we are standing upon the firm foundation of the gospel or not. I know a lot of people that can, that can uh, intellectually and verbally speak the gospel that aren't saved, and they would even claim they're not saved, but they know the gospel, they've heard it. It is not the talking about the gospel, but it is the walking of the gospel call that proves if we are in Christ or not. It proves whether we are standing on a true foundation of faith or not. Has that ever occurred to you? And, and I wanted to make this point this morning. Excuse me, uh, my nose is running a little bit. Has it ever occurred to you that God is not impressed by how much you think you know? Has it ever occurred to you? Because I know a lot of people that <laughs> they're insufferable to talk to because they just think they know so much and you can tell that they think they know so much. Has it ever occurred to you that God could care less about how much you think you know? Because you know nothing compared to him. You're not going to impress God by your knowledge. Ever. You, you, you tell God how much you know and he scoffs laughs. How many people love to sit and talk and impress people by how much they know about the Bible or know about any topic, right? But when it comes to serve, to do, they're nowhere to be found, right? When it comes to exercise true Christian love, they're first to abandon or slander. When it comes time to evangelize, they're nowhere to be found. When it comes time to serve at, maybe someone at church needs help with a project at home and they can't finish it themselves, when it comes time to do that, they're not going to do that, but man, they will sit and talk to you about how much they know about the Bible. Do you really think you can impress the infinite God of the universe with your knowledge? I say this, church, the time for pretentious living in God's church in this culture today is long past us. We must become mature Christians. We must grow up is what we need to do. Grow up. You claim to know the Lord. You claim to be a follower of the gospel. Amen. Hallelujah. Now do it. Abide in it. Live it. Stake your life upon it. I would rather serve in a church that only knew five of the most important commands of Jesus and did all of them and devoted every moment of their life to those five commands than a church that knew every command listed in the book and yet did none of them. 
any day of the week. Give me that church. I'll serve in the church with limited knowledge, but with full surrender. <clears throat> then one with great knowledge. And no surrender. So with a humble and sober spirit, which type of man or woman are you? Have you staked your life upon abiding and living in the gospel promise? Have you looked intently upon the law of the Lord, saw just how wicked your reflection is, and then cried out to the Lord for salvation? And I say if you've done that, I say hallelujah, amen, praise God. And if you haven't, the Lord says today is the day of salvation. Now is the day. Don't wait. Don't wait till tomorrow. God is calling you today to obey the gospel call, to be an effectual doer of the word of God. Humble yourself before the God, before the God of the universe. Cry out to him, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Just like the publican did, right? The Pharisees up front saying, oh, Lord, thank you. I'm not like these other people. I'm good. The publican is in the back saying, oh, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Humble yourself before the Lord, church, and he will do what? Lift you up. That's how James ends this entire book. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. It's all about humility. James starts with humility, ends with humility, and in between he talks about how to live a gospel, a life devoted to the gospel. So like I said, with a humble and sober spirit, examine yourself this morning. Look intently in the mirror and then respond. Do not simply hear the word of truth this morning, church. Respond to it. Ingest it. As James says in verse 21, allow it to be implanted in you that it might save your soul. I don't want anyone to walk away from this church service this morning in the same delusion they were in when they got here. Have you seen, do you understand the type of person you are without Christ? A lost, wicked sinner? And if so, have you called upon the name of Jesus Christ to save you? But further than this, think about last week's sermon. I know many of you very, very intimately, and I know many of you, most of you, uh, are, are, are true believers. You're saved, and the evidence is in your life. There's fruit in your life. But I want to ask you this. You've already, you've, you've already, I don't want to say got this down like we, can, we, like we have some part in it, but you've already been called to salvation, right? Do you listen to what comes next? Think about what we talked about last week, right? Everyone must be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, right? Did you leave that service last week and then maybe Sunday or Monday go back to the exact same way you were acting before you heard that sermon? Are you hot-headed, foolish? If you are a believer this morning, does the word have any effect on you anymore? Or have, you out, have you outgrown it? Have you outgrown the word? When you read it, do you, do you read it with eager anticipation or do you say this to yourself, oh, I can skip this portion. I've read this a thousand times. I hope not. I hope every word of this incredible truth, when we pick up the Bible, we look at it and we feast upon it like it's a banquet and we're a starving man or a starving woman. Allow the word to change you, church. If you are a new creation in Christ, I say hallelujah, but now continue to abide in the word of truth. The word of God is an agent of change, church. And if you continually, continually leave the presence of God's word, whether it's on a Sunday morning or a Bible study at home or whatever, if you continue, continually leave the presence of God's word unchanged, then James is warning you, you're living a life of delusion. Wake up. Wake up. Humble yourself before God. And I say that again. Today is the day to humble yourself. Call upon the Lord for salvation. And if you've already done that, and if you are a true believer, then call upon the Lord this morning to renew your heart, renew your mind, and to open up his word of truth to you that it might change you, sanctify you and to the person God has called you to be so that not only you might be saved, but that you will be blessed in all that you do. Continue. Abide. 
for his glory and his namesake. Let's pray.